my name is Bryce. For those of you that do not know me, uh, I'm a pastoral resident here, so I'll be filling in. We are uh, going to have the great opportunity today to talk about accountability uh, and pursuing accountability. And so for some of us, that is a very difficult subject um, because I know for me, I am someone who is um, stubborn in lots of different ways and I'm very prideful and I don't like to tell people when I have messed up. That's not something that I like to admit. And so accountability for me is something that has been very difficult in the past. Um, and I also think because in our culture today, we are taught not to really show emotions towards other people, right? Hey, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing great. You're not really doing great. That's just what you're supposed to say. You're not really supposed to go anywhere past that. And so accountability is something that oftentimes we can struggle with. And so that's what we're going to talk about this evening is pursuing accountability. And so uh, scripture is clear that God will hold us accountable. Uh, Romans uh, 14, 12, Paul says that we will all give an account to God one day. And so scripture is very clear that God will hold us accountable. And if we are fearful of judgment from another sinful person, how much more should we fear accountability from a holy God? And I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but a lot of times that's why we don't do accountability because we're scared of what somebody might think of us if we share with them uh, the areas in life where we sin the most and where we struggle the most. We're scared of how they will uh, judge us for those things. But what we have to remember is whoever we're telling, they're just as sinful as we are. And so if we're fearful of that and we don't want people to know that, then we should fear that from a holy God so much more because He is perfect. Um, and so that's just something to think about. But And, and as we talk this morning, we will, we will or this, this evening, we will look at that and how we... When we have somebody that knows our secrets and is holding us accountable, it helps us to be holier. And that's uh, a great thing. So first, we're going to discuss what accountability is not. And if I'm going to, I try not to offend people, but if I am, it's going to be in these next two things. Uh, probably the second one, if anything. But what accountability is not. The first thing that accountability is not is accountability is not gossip. And that's very important for us to know. If somebody is confiding in you to tell you, hey, listen, this is an area in my life where I've been sinning the past couple of weeks. This is something I'm struggling with. Then that is yours to keep. Um, it's not, hey, I'm going to meet with Daniel up here so he can tell me all of his secrets and then I can go tell everybody else. That's not what it's for. And it's not so that even if we don't tell anybody, it's not so that we can just acquire these secrets about somebody else that may be useful to us in the future or so that we can know these uh, cool, interesting stories. It is to make each other better, um, but it is definitely not to gossip. And the second thing that accountability is not is accountable, accountability is not follow your heart. That is one of my... Uh, pet peeves in life is when I hear somebody ask somebody else for advice and they say, well, just follow your heart and it'll be okay. That's, not, that's never a good thing to tell somebody is to follow their heart because Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So if the heart is deceitful above all things, why would we ever tell anyone to follow their heart? If you follow your heart, you will end up sinning, and that is not the way to go. And so that is another thing that accountability is not. And I know that people that say that, they mean well, right? They, you know, just do whatever you want to do, and that is a term that is meant to mean something well. But ultimately, when we give that advice to someone to follow their heart, then we are saying follow something that is deceitful and that is wicked and that will ultimately lead you down the path of destruction. So that is another thing that accountability is not. It is not follow your heart. So now we're going to look at accountability in Scripture. And the first thing we're going to look at is five reasons why we should have accountability. And these are very uh, important things for us to, to have. The first one is that accountability gives us an opportunity to show love. Accountability gives us an opportunity to show love. Uh, John 15, 17 says, These things I command you so that you will love one another. And Romans 12, 10, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. It's important that we have this opportunity to be able to show love to someone. There are plenty of people that we come into contact with that they go through every day and they don't really feel love. Um, and there are so many times that, that we neglect the opportunity to show someone love. But when we're able to have accountability with someone, then we are able um, to show them love. 
And that's, that, that's one of the great things that we're able to do. The second thing is that we are able to bear one another's burdens. To bear one another's burdens. So when we ask someone to hold us accountable, we ask them, uh, we pretty much open the door and say, hey, Daniel, can you hold me accountable? And by doing that, I am asking Daniel that every, every time I sin, uh, we, meet, we would meet once, twice, once a week, uh, once every two weeks. And every time I sin, we would go over that. And I would say, hey, this is what I've been struggling with. And this is what I have uh, this is what I've been reading in Scripture. And these are things that I need prayer for. And so that when I do sin, He can hold me accountable in that. But also, He can pray for me and He can love me and He can speak into my life. And He can help bear my burdens. And, and so I can go and just say, hey, I am struggling this past week. Um, I'm having... Um, a hard time with one of my friends. Um, they, they're not um, doing what the Lord has asked them to do. And, and he, can, he can bear that burden with me and go along in that with me. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And we are commanded to do that is to bear one another's burdens. And a great way to do that is through accountability. The third reason that we should have accountability is that accountability gives us an outlet for confession. Accountability gives us an outlet for confession. So many times in life, we, uh, we, we do something wrong, we do something sinful, and we keep it up inside, and it bothers us for, for however long because we, we know it inside and nobody else knows it. But when we have accountability, it gives us a safe place for that confession because somebody else has signed up to say, hey, listen, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you've sinned with, I will listen to those. You can tell me those things, and we will walk through those things. Because ultimately, when you confess your sins to another person, uh, not only is that biblical to be able to do, but then they can even help you to not um, to, to overcome those temptations even more as well. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So it's important that we confess our sins to one another. The next reason that we should have accountability is ultimately accountability makes both people holier. Ultimately, accountability makes both people holier. And so that is kind of, that's kind of the end goal of accountability is that as we are holding each other accountable, as we are saying, hey, you shouldn't do this. This is something that, that I think you should do. This is an area that I think you're struggling with. The purpose of that is is that you will be making that other person holier, that you will be helping them to not sin as much and in turn becoming more holy. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Iron sharpens iron. And so as two people go at it, they are sharpening each other. They are making each other better. Um, they are helping each other out. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 here is kind of like uh, the, the banner verse for accountability, right? We are to meet with one another. We are to stir up one another to love and good works. And not only are we to do that, um, but we are to encourage one another as well. And so all of those things there, the purpose of meeting together is to make each other better. That is what he's saying. Hey, do these things so that you can encourage one another and you can make each other better. And so we, we know that um, I'm a big sports fan and... We know that there are athletes who on the basketball court or on the football field, they make everybody else around them better. And one of the reasons that they do that, not just because they are, they are so good, but another way that they do that is they work harder than everybody else. And so when you have a leader who is working hard and working harder than anyone you've ever seen, it makes you want to work harder as well. And so they are making each other better. And so we can do that in our own lives. And so it's not only um, urging each other and your accountability partner to do better, but as they see you working things and they say, man, that person, they're really excelling in this area. I want to be more like that. And so we can do that. And so it's important um, that we are making each other holier. And then the fifth reason is that accountability encourages us to show grace. Accountability encourages us to show grace. And I don't know about any of you, but there are days when I need that. I need somebody to come 
so that they give me an outlet to show grace because I struggle with that, right? I struggle with showing people grace every once in a while. And so it's important to have that accountability because I can show someone grace uh, through that. And so Luke 17, 3 says, pay attention to, you, to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So there's this idea here as an account, as someone, if you are someone's accountability partner, then if they are sinful, if they are sinning, it is your job to rebuke them. But when they repent of that, then you are able to forgive them and you are able to show them grace through those things. And then Romans 14, 3, let, no, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. And so that's something that for, for our standards may be a little different, but at the same time, there is a great opportunity to show grace when we are meeting with someone who we may have a lot of differences. And in the midst of those differences and uh, in beliefs and different things like that, we are able to show each other grace through those things as well. So those are five reasons why we should have accountability. Because ultimately, um, when we get to show love, and we get to show grace to people, and we get to make each other better, it propels us to be holier as well. Because we know that as we are striving to be like Christ, Christ loved and Christ showed grace, and He did those things. And so as we get to do that with other people, we can do that as well. So, uh, next, looking at accountability in Scripture, we're going to look at Samuel's example of accountability. So, if you will turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we're not going to read all of 1 Samuel chapter 15, but I am going to give you a brief synopsis of what is going on here. Um, so, we know that Israel wanted a king. God said, I'm the ultimate king. Um, and they continued to fight God on the, the fact that they wanted a king. So eventually God put King Saul in that position as the king. And so chapter 15 rolls around. And God sends Saul to um, the Amaleks. And he tells them to go and to destroy everything. He says, Saul, once Israel is done with them, there should be nothing left. There should be no people left. Kill all the men, women, and children. Kill all the livestock. Completely destroy everything everything. And so Saul goes and he tells the Lord, yes, Lord, I will, I will do this. And so he takes his army to the Amalekites and they begin to destroy the Amalekites. But they do not destroy everything. As we see, as we will see in a moment, um, Saul leaves and he destroys pretty much everything except for he spares the king's life and brings him back and then he keeps all of the best livestock and sheep um, and oxen and those things. And he keeps all of those things. And so he directly disobeys what the Lord has commanded him to do. Because the Lord has commanded him to destroy everything and Saul has not done that. So that's where we're going to pick up in, uh, let's start, 1 Samuel 15, let's start in verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. Verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king for, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. So Samuel is the one who um, made Saul king. The Lord had been using him, and so he made Saul king. And then as Saul goes and he does not obey the Lord, the Lord goes to Samuel and says, Hey, I wish that I had not made Saul the king. And so the first thing that Samuel uh, shows us here is that accountability requires difficult conversations if, even when we don't like it. It's very evident here that Samuel does not like what's going on. As it says that he, he wept and he was angry all night long. Because the Lord told him to go tell Saul, you are not going to be the king anymore. And so Samuel was very upset about that. But it's important for us to know that. Um, that accountability requires difficult conversations even we, when we don't like it. If you remember Galatians chapter 2, uh, when... 
Paul goes and opposes Peter because Peter had been in sin, there's a chance that Paul took pride and really enjoyed going to oppose Peter. But I would guess that he probably didn't, right? And so the, all throughout Scripture, we see where people have had to go and have those difficult conversations. But for most of us, there are some oddballs in the room that we really enjoy confrontation. And we're like, yes, I get to confront somebody, I'm going to do it. But for most of us, that's not something that we like to do because we don't like for people to be upset with us. And so Samuel, he knew what he was getting ready to do. Um, and so he had to, have, to go and have a difficult, difficult conversation even when he didn't like it. And ultimately, if we, have to, if we feel like we need to have a difficult conversation with someone because they are in sin, if we are not willing to do that, then we are not showing them love and we are not showing them grace through that. Because you know this, especially probably my parents in the room, if you know somebody who is sinning and is headed towards destruction and you let them continue in the path of destruction, no one would say that that was love, right? We would all go and try to stop that person that was not headed to destruction. And so it's the same concept even here. And so he shows us first that accountability requires those difficult conversations. And then we continue on as we go here. And so uh, 1 Samuel 15, 16. So Samuel goes, he confronts Saul, and then um, we'll start in verse 13. It says, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. So do you see what, what Saul does here? The Lord clearly told him to destroy everything. Saul comes back with these things, and he tells Samuel, hey, look, look what I brought back with me. I followed the Lord's commandment. And, Saul, and Samuel says, then what are these things? And and uh, Saul says, all these things that we needed, we brought back for, uh, that were good, we brought back for offerings and for sacrifices. Anything that was not good, we left for destruction. And then look what Samuel says in verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And then Samuel continues on and he tells Saul what the Lord has said to him. And so the next thing that we see with Samuel is that holding someone accountable doesn't mean we give our opinion. It means that we give God's truth. Holding someone accountable doesn't mean that we give our opinion. It means that we give God's truth. And that's very important because sometimes giving our opinion is much easier than giving God's truth. I have a... Um, Katie and I have a couple, um, we have friends that are a couple, I don't know how to say that, we have a couple friends, and um, they are, they're newly married, they married a month before we did, and they, uh, he is in seminary right now, finishing up school, she is teaching, but they have known for the last four years that they are called to missions overseas, and they are going to live overseas, and I know that, and he is one of my best friends, and I am personally, I'm not really looking forward to that day, right? Because I know that once he goes, right now I see him two or three times a week, and I know that once he goes overseas, I won't see him maybe ever again, and I'm not going to get to talk to him very much at all, and that, that's a scary thing for me. And so the reason that this is important, that we give someone God's truth and not our opinion, is because you, can you imagine knowing that I struggle with that and he comes to me and he says, hey Bryce, we're, my wife and I, we're really struggling because we know that God has called us overseas, but we, we just, we don't know if we have the money for it. We're struggling to trust the Lord that he's going to provide for us and we're second guessing ourselves that we, we may not want to go over there. Now, if I'm giving my opinion, I'm saying, that's right, stay right here, stay here forever, right? That, that's, that's what my opinion wants to say. But if I'm giving him God's truth, I'm saying, hey, listen, I know that's a scary thing, but I also know that, that God has called all of us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and, and he has called them to that. And I know that for you, that the Lord has called you to that for the past five years, and that is where he is calling you. And so while that may be a difficult time, um, I'll definitely be praying and I'll help you in any way that, you, that I can, but you and your wife still need to go and you need to pursue that and you need to make it overseas because that's where the Lord has called you.
See the difference in that? If I'm giving them my opinion, it's completely different than if I'm giving them God's truth that they have been called somewhere and they know that and they, are, they need to follow the Lord's commands that he has given them. So it's very important that we are not giving people our opinions. And sometimes that's hard because our opinions generally are, are, are selfish reasons for telling somebody something. But we need to make sure that we aren't doing that and that we are, um, that we are giving them what God's truth says and that we are giving them God's word word. And so Samuel continues on and he tells Saul everything that he does wrong. Uh, pretty much the, the way that, that this works is Saul went and he did not destroy everything and his reasoning was for sacrifices. But why did they have to offer sacrifices in the Old Testament? Because they needed to make a payment for their sins, right? For when they were disobedient. And had Saul destroyed everything, would he, would he have had a need for sacrifices in that moment? He would not have been because he would not have been disobedient. So I find it ironic that he was disobedient and getting a sacrifice and getting things to sacrifice for the same exact thing that he would have to use it on. When if he would just have destroyed everything in the first place, those sheep and oxen, he would not have needed because he would have had no sacrifice in this moment. And so Samuel tells him, what you have done in the eyes of the Lord, they are not good. You have not been obedient. And so Saul continues and he says, and, and he begins to repent. Um, but then we see that he doesn't really have a repentful heart because he asks if he can bow down before the Lord in front of all the people. And what Saul wants is for people to recognize who he is. And so we, we continue on um, in verse 34. Yes, in verse 34. Um, oh, I skipped too much. In verse 34, it says, Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul, and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Continuing into chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? Since I have rejected him from being king over Israel, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons." And so the next thing that we see in this is that while someone may turn from the Lord, we must not let it change our mission. We must not let it change our mission. And as I was going over this with, with my wonderful wife, Katie, she said, is this really what you want to show in accountability? Because it doesn't really turn out that well. And I was like, well, yes, it is. Because that's the thing. When we're agreeing to do accountability with someone and when someone sins and we're holding them um, and we're rebuking them for that and, and, and trying to um, help correct their paths, it's not easy. It's, it's messy oftentimes. And I'm not saying that we should give up um, on them. We should definitely continue working with them. But Saul here turned away from the Lord and the Lord took him away from Samuel. And so Samuel had to continue his mission. And so can you imagine if after this, if after God told him to get up, if Samuel continued to weep over Saul, we would have never gotten King David. And so Samuel's mission was ultimately to go and was to anoint the king who would become the king of Israel, who would become the king who is after God's own heart, who then the Savior would come through that lineage. And so Samuel's mission was much greater than that. And so for us, we must uh, be good stewards of what God has given to us and those whom he, who we should be holding accountable. We must be good stewards of that. But we should also always remember our mission, that it is to glorify God in all that we do. Um, and hopefully those that we are holding accountable, that we are accountability partners with, they will come with us and you can go together because we know that two is greater than one. But, but sometimes we are called to go and do that mission on our own. Um, and, and the Lord wants to use us in those ways. And so that's a great way that we see accountability. And so I encourage you just for extra study. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, here we have Samuel holding Saul accountable. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 is when Nathan goes and holds David accountable. And it's a really interesting thing to look at because the stories are very similar in the fact that both kings sinned. They were both confronted for their sin in, in the same manner, but their responses are vastly different. In the end, Saul, you could argue, technically repents, but as I said earlier, he, he's still very prideful in that. And so just look at the contrast between Saul's prideful reluctancy in 
confessing his sin and asking for forgiveness versus David's asking of forgiveness with a contrite heart. And they're very different, but the stories are, are set up and actually read very similar. So for extra study, I would encourage you to go and, and look at both of those and contrast those stories uh, because they are very interesting to look at. So now uh, we're going to continue on and looking at steps for accountability. Steps for accountability. And here are just some things to consider. Consider. So when, you, when you're wanting to say, hey, I want an accountability partner. I want to meet with them. Look at this. Is, is Number one is how often will you meet? Some people choose to meet once a week. Some people it's once a month. I would recommend um, no less than once a month. That's, that's really good. If you can do more than that, that would be a great way to do it, but um, at least once a month at the bare minimum. Another thing to look at is what venue will you, you use to meet? Some people, uh, Travis has said before, he calls somebody and they, and they talk every Wednesday morning. Um, so, so some people use the phone. Some people prefer to meet face-to-face. -face. Um, with today's technology, you can Skype someone and see them face-to-face from the comfort of your couch. Whatever, whatever you need to do uh, to make sure that those meetings happen. Um, I, would, I would encourage some people try to meet in a public place. Um, I I would say that that somewhere private would be uh, a little better because you are pouring your heart out to someone right and so if you want the person next to you at Starbucks to listen to that then, then that's a great thing uh, if you want that but uh, th so that's something to think about another thing to think about is do you want to incorporate a Bible study are you going to meet together uh, for 30 minutes every day before you go to work and just talk about the essentials or are you going to make this um, starting at you know at an hour and are you going to study through scripture together and that's a great way to be able to hold people accountable because let's say that you do both agree okay for the next month we're going to read through um, the gospel of Matthew for the next month and so you set yourself up with goals that by the time we meet next week we'll have this read and so we can discuss this and so that way it's easier to hold each other accountable for hey are you staying in scripture are you continuing to study this another thing that I didn't put in your handouts that you might want to discuss is do you want an accountability partner or an accountability group uh, some people choose to meet with three or four people instead of just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I, would, I would say that um, accountability partners may be a little better because I know this. Uh, my senior year of college, I lived in a basement with five other guys. We called ourselves the Basement Dwellers. That was our nickname. Nobody else caught on to that nickname, so we just called ourselves that, but it was okay. But all five of us, and, and we were best friends. We still are best friends. Um, all of our wives or girlfriends are now friends, um, but that's just because we're friends, so they have to be there. But I know this, that when we lived together, we somewhat held each other accountable the most that we could. But even now, um, I'm still close to all of them, but out of those five other guys that I lived with, there are two that I'm closer with than uh, the other three. And so think about that. If you are doing an accountability group, because there's probably going to end up being someone that you're a little closer to, and so maybe you should branch off and just do one-on-one -on -one accountability with someone else. And so that's something just to think about as well uh, when, when you look into that. And so and the next thing that we're going to do um, for the remainder of our time here is just to look at questions to ask for the six D's of discipleship. So what we've done is because generally um, you can find lots of great resources online to be able to go and to ask questions. So when you meet with your accountability partner, you want to set up that meeting and you want to have a list of questions and you want to ask each other those questions. And these are going to be questions that you have the understanding that you are going to be brutally honest in the answering of these questions. So when you're accountability partner looks you in the eye and ask what sin you have struggled with this week you don't respond nothing right you've struggled with something in the past week I can guarantee you of that and so that you are holding each other accountable in that so Travis gave us a couple months ago the 60s of discipleship so we we decided to go and to form questions and so um, you will see in your handout that you have a third blank that is empty so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through these six D's I'm gonna give you the first two questions so at the end you'll definitely have 12 solid questions that you can ask somebody when you meet but what I want us to do is at our tables take a minute or two um, for each one and we're and I want you to formulate a third question there and so that way because there are questions that that Travis and I thought of and we went over but I'm sure that some of you have some fantastic questions for each of these and so I want to give you the opportunity to be able to make this your own as well but 
at the end of the day, when you leave here, you will have a great resource to be able to go and meet with somebody and have great questions to ask them. So the first thing that we have here, the first D that we're going to go over is delight. And so just a brief overview for everybody. Delight is discipleship must be motivated by the wondrous delight of knowing Jesus. We must delight ourselves in Christ, understanding the weightiness of our sin, but also the weightiness of His grace and His mercy. And through that, all that we do, we are delighting in Him. And so the first question to ask in that is, what has the Lord done for you this week where you may not have noticed His work? Because so often we go around and we are completely oblivious to what the Lord is doing around us. But when we honestly sit down and think about it and see what the Lord is doing in our lives, it makes us delight in Him even more. The second question here, um, is, is there anything that has taken away your zeal for Christ? Is there anything in your life that has taken away this delight? What is it? Let's discuss it so that we can get it out of here so that your delight in Christ can go back up. So again, that's what we're looking at is delight. Is what is something that just helps you to reveal um, just the wonderfulness of what Christ has done. So go ahead and for a couple minutes just discuss at your table what is a good third question to go under delight. All right, so as, as we come back together, uh, one or two uh, people shout out, what are, what's another question that, that you came up with at your table? Donald, what was yours again? That was a good one. What was it? <laughs> is that him or me? What has caused you to delight in the Lord? What has caused you to delight in the Lord this week? That's a really good one. Um, and, and discussing that. And have you made an effort to delight in the Lord? Yes, ma'am. Um, we talked about where did you find your joy in your life this week? And did that become a replacement for God's work in you? That's good. Where did you find your joy and did that become a replacement for God's work in you? That's very good. One more. Yes, sir. Has your faith been reinforced this week? Has your faith been reinforced this week? That's really good. That's really good because oftentimes we... Uh, we begin doubting, is this really what the Lord's showing me? And he, he does something and, and it, it reinforces that, yes, this is definitely the Lord's will for my life. Um, and we're able to delight in that and take comfort in that, that He is faithful. That's really good. All right. Uh, so I promise, I'm, I, I believe personally, formulating the questions, delight is the one that I struggled with the most. So if this was difficult for you for this one, don't worry. The other ones, in my opinion, are a little easier to formulate questions for. So the next one is disobedience. Disobedience, uh, discipleship must warn against disobedience in any sinful leanings specific to the person. So this one is, where have you been disobedient? So just like the first question, what sin or sins do you need to confess? What corrective actions can you take to overcome this temptation? So in your, when you're meeting with somebody and you say, hey, what, what uh, sins do you need to confess? What sin have you been struggling with? Don't just say, I'll be praying for you for that. Talk it out and say, what is something, what is a corrective action that we can take so that this temptation is, is something that you can overcome? So that next week when we meet, you can say, hey, I was tempted with this a couple times, but I didn't give in to it. Right? So what's something that you can do? And so discuss that. How am I going to get this to where I can overcome this temptation? The next one. What have you thought, said, or done that you question whether it is, or, it is sin or not? And that's probably one um, that, that there are times in our lives that we do things and, and we feel guilty about them. But, or we don't feel guilty, but we think, I feel like I should feel guilty about this, right? We, I, we have those moments every once in a while where we do things. And we're like, I don't know if this is right or wrong, um, so I, I need to talk about it with someone. So those are, those are the first two questions for disobedience. So go ahead again. I'll put this up there for you. Um, but what are some ways, what are some questions that we can ask to, to get to the root of of disobedience. All right, so, so what are some questions that we got for disobedience? Throw a couple out. What are some questions that we got for disobedience? Way in the back. What are the sins you don't want to let go of? That's really good. That's great. If you were in the, um, if, if you were in our gospel group this morning or, or this past week, then that's one of the things that you probably discussed is when, when Peter tells us to, to get rid of all 
uh, sin, malice, greed, and envy. Uh, so what are some sins that we have that, that we have to cut off, that we have to get rid of? That, that's really good. What else do we have? Go for it. Um, where have you ventured close to sin and failed to put up fences to keep you clear of sin's temptations? Mm, yep, so, so where have you gone close to sin and, and failed to put up um, those fences or those safeguards uh, to stay away from those? One more. I know somebody's got a really good one out there. They're just shy to say it. Be bold. Sin that makes you feel separated from God. Okay, is there sin that makes you feel separated from God? That's really that's really good. So um, I, I will also say Travis and I decided not to put it in here because we said if we put it in there, half the room's gonna say, ah, oh, that doesn't matter for me. But I, I would say for uh, some of the room, for the majority, uh, maybe not the majority, but for some of the room, this is a good one, is you need to ask the question um, because you need to face it head on is, have you looked at any explicit material this past week? Uh, because I'm going to address it because I, I don't mind it, but I think that it, even in the church that pornography is the most unaddressed sin um, that there is. Because it is, it is a silent killer that people don't always pay attention to because people can't see you outright with that and so we ignore it because nobody can see it so I don't need to worry about it but um, that that's a big one and so if that's something you struggle with um, maybe that you take the lead and you ask somebody else that question so then they'll have to ask it to you in return if that's something that you struggle with but um, don't leave that out just because it, it, it's awkward to talk about um, in that um, possibly more than anything else. But, but that's another big one uh, to put on there for disobedience. So the next one is doctrine. Doctrine. Discipleship must wisely equip the follower to possess competent biblical doctrine. So our first two questions for doctrine are what has the Lord taught you recently? What has the Lord taught you recently? And that's important because a lot of us, we can tell, if somebody says, hey, share your testimony with me, then you will share your testimony and you will tell us about something that happened 20 years ago. And if I say, what has the Lord taught you recently? You have no idea. And so that's a really important one that even from that moment of conversion that you are still staying in the word and that the Lord is still teaching you things and that you can still give a testimony of what the Lord has done for you recently, not just, um, not just five or ten years ago. So what has the Lord taught you recently? Whether that is through scripture, whether um, that is through prayer, whatever that may be, what has the Lord taught you? Secondly, what is the condition of your soul? What is the condition of your soul? And so that one um, is, a, is a little different, but... But some of us, we just feel beat down. And we, we struggle with maybe, um, like the gentleman said in the back, maybe we're struggling with sins that it makes us feel like we're separated from God. And we feel like we're in a pit and we feel like we can't get out. And we don't want to share that with anybody, but we need somebody to ask us, hey, how is your soul? How are you feeling? Um, and, and we need somebody to come and to give us that hope and to be able to speak into our lives um, that you know what there is hope for you through Christ and so that's a very good question so all right so what questions did we get for doctrine what questions did we get for doctrine this one was another tougher one I'll tell you that I, I put um, what do you believe about blank based on scripture because I think with the doctrine part of discipleship that we could come to our group or our family people and say, okay, I don't know enough about heaven. Like, I know what I think, but if I had to take you to scripture, I might not know. So I think you could take any doctrine in Christian faith and just leave that blank, and your people or whoever you're meeting with, you guys go to scripture and like look that up. And then the other one was, did you hear anything taught this week that you want, were not sure was true? So like whether that was at church or on the radio or if somebody said something and it, and it kind of bristled up in the spirit within you and you're thinking, but how do I know what I believe about that? Did you go wrestle with that? Those are really good. Yes, thank you very much. Anything else? So I'll also say, uh, Joy mentioned the doctrines, what do you believe about blank? So if you are in a gospel group and you have a book of the gospel project, if you haven't seen it yet, look for it the next time. But every week there is, uh, for each lesson, there is a 
thing in the column that says key doctrines. And it talks about a key doctrine every single week that goes along with that lesson. So if you're going through that and you're meeting with an accountability partner um, and you want to discuss those doctrines, that's a great place to get those from. It provides you with that doctrine. It gives you a little bit of basic information on that. And so you can look at that and you can carry on that conversation about those doctrines. Anybody else real quick before we move on? Nope. All right. Uh, the next one is development. Discipleship must address areas of calling with the intention to bring about ministry development. Development. So the first one is, who have you shared the gospel with recently? Who have you shared the gospel with recently? And I think that this one, more than any other, it helps us dive in to the other uh, five Ds of discipleship as well. Because when we are sharing the gospel with people, it helps us delight in the Lord. I don't know if you have ever had the privilege to uh, lead someone to the Lord. But it is great for that person who accepts Christ, but the spiritual high that you get off of it as well is fantastic. And just the way that the Lord works through that um, and, and the feeling of that, and you're able to delight in the Lord through that as well. And then ultimately it falls under uh, discipline as well because we are, um, or disobedience and, and discipline because we are doing exactly what the Lord has commanded us to do. And so that's a, that's a great thing. So who have you shared the gospel with recently? And uh, if you do have an accountability partner, and so I'll use Daniel up here again. So let's say Daniel and I meet every week, and I say, hey, Daniel, who have you shared the gospel with recently? And every week he tells me the name of another person. And I'm not able to give him a single one. After the first couple times, it's going to push me to go share the gospel with somebody because I'm going to be a little uh, envious that he has a different person every single time and I, uh, and I don't have anybody. And I'm going to feel a little bad about that and it's going to push me to go share the gospel with somebody else. The second one, how are you cultivating intentional gospel relationships? Because when we share the gospel with people, um, a lot of times it is cold call evangelism where we walk up and say, hey, let me tell you about the Lord. But then other times it takes uh, building relationships to be able to speak into their lives and share the gospel. And so we should have both of those going on. So who or, or how are you cultivating a relationship, an intentional gospel relationship that the point of that relationship, sure, you want to get to know them, but ultimately the reason you want to get to know them is so that you can share the gospel with them. Um, and so that goes under development there. So go ahead um, in your, at your tables again and discuss a third question that you could add to that. All right. So um, as we've had our our third question for development. Do we have anybody that wants to share a third question uh, that they came up with for development? Have you been attending Rocky Creek Baptist Church? <laughs> That's right. Um, that, that is a good one, though. Have you, have you been attending church? Uh, if you're here, preferably. <laughs> so so have, have you been doing that? Any other ones? Have you missed any opportunities? Have you missed any opportunities to share the gospel? That's really good. Yep. What's holding you back? What's holding you back from sharing the gospel? Yes, sir. Those are good. How has God uniquely gifted you to serve, and how have you used those gifts in the community or even church this week? Because it's not just about um, the gospel, but it's also about uniquely being gifted to serve or have passion for a different age group. And how are you plugging in to use that or grow in that, just grow in your confidence in that in your church and community. And I can see y'all, y'all want to volunteer to do something right now, come see me after this. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Joy, she'll come. She'll come stand right up here, and she'll wait for it. But that. But in, in, in all honesty, that is really good because there are some of us who the Lord has gifted us with extremely wonderful talents, and we're sitting on the sidelines, letting everybody else do the work. And it's time to get on the court and to go and and to use our gifts and to use our talents, so that we're not just using them selfishly for ourselves. But the the body of Christ gets to see those as well, and we're able to use those. So that is a good one. Uh, what are ways that that you can use your gifts and your talents in order to serve the kingdom of God. That's a great one. One more? We had a lot for that one. That was good. Yes, sir? What are we doing to maintain these relationships? What are you doing to maintain these relationships? That's really good because um, I know from, from personal experience as well that there, there are people that I've met, I've come into contact with. I, I started strong on that relationship because it's brand new. And then you get into it and it gets more difficult to meet and, and, and you kind of fall off of that. So that's really good. What are you doing to maintain those relationships? So continuing on, uh, the next one is discipline. Discipleship must train in areas of spiritual discipline for continual growth. 
And so those are things that we've kind of been going over over the past couple weeks under uh, spiritual disciplines. But uh, the first one, what verses have you memorized and or reviewed since we last met? Because scripture memorization is a vital part to uh, spiritual growth. And so that's a really important question. What are ways uh, or, or what are different verses that we've memorized or reviewed since we last met? Uh, I'll tell you, going back, uh, my, my group of friends uh, that, I, that I lived with in school after Travis a couple months ago now, after he did um, his spiritual disciplines on memorization, and he sat there and he quoted 30 verses from straight memory, and I was like, man, I wish I could do that. Um, I, I could do it with some smaller ones, but some of those, I don't know how he did that. And, and I said, I want to be able to do that. And so I went, and I don't know if any of you know what Quizlet is, um, but it's a, it's a study tool that you use. And so I made Quizlets of about 50 verses, and I uh, sent the link to my friends, and I said, hey, guys, whoever memorizes the most of these will set a date in May, and whoever has the most memorized, the rest of us will buy you dinner, and we'll go and we'll sit around the table and we'll just quote scripture together that evening. And whoever says the most, uh, you get free food. And so that, that's one way to do it. Uh, and you can hold people accountable in that as well. And if you're competitive like me, that's a great way to do it because it's not just you trying to memorize, but I've got competition with five other guys and I have to win um, or I'll be a little upset. And so uh, that's one way to do that. The second one, what area of discipline have you struggled with? Whether it be prayer, Bible reading, fasting, whatever it may be, what area of discipline, of your spiritual disciplines have you struggled with? There, there are times... Um, where I go through the day and the first time that I pray is when I need something. Um, and, and so I, and I struggle with that prayer. And there are days when I don't wake up when I want to and it throws the rest of my day off and I don't read my Bible. And I say I'll do it when I get home from work and I get home from work and I can't do it. Or I usually I try to do it at work before. That's the first thing I do is my computer starting up as I take 15 minutes. It does not take 15 minutes for my computer to start up, but I use that as a, as a good excuse. But if I walk in the door at work and, it, and I'm slammed from the time I get there to the time I leave, um, and so it's important that we don't just try to fit God into our schedules, uh, but that we fit everything else into um, a schedule and, and make sure that the Lord has priority for that. So what area of, dis of disciplines have you struggled with, uh, whatever that may be? So uh, go ahead and take just a couple minutes to, to think of a third question for discipline. All right, we'll go ahead and come back together. Our, our time is running short. So what's a third question that some of us uh, got for discipline? Yes, what do we need to take away so that we can have time for our spiritual disciplines? Anything else? Yes, sir. Take time for God every day. Do you take time for God every day? That's a good one. One more? Anybody? Yes, sir. Is your thoughts of Christ for good works or have they been of self? Mm. Are your thoughts of Christ and good works or have they been about yourself? That's good. And so uh, the last one here is dependence. Discipleship must continually acknowledge the complete dependence upon Jesus for the believer's maturity. So many times in life, I'm, I'm thankful that, that God shows me that I can't do things on my own. And while those things are, are difficult at times, but, but it helps me to depend on Christ even more. And sometimes we get ahead of ourselves uh, because we think we can do things. And so... Um, Dependence is a good one. So the first question, what has become an idol in your life? What, uh, what has become an idol that um, I'm not depending on God because I'm depending on this um, and I'm depending on something else? The second one, what are you specifically praying for right now? What is something that you know it is impossible um, for you to do, but through Christ it is something that he can, he can do with no problem whatsoever? What is something that you are praying for that the Lord will do in your life or in the life of someone else, and you are depending on him to answer that prayer for you? Um, so those are two good questions. Take just a, just a minute or two um, and, and discuss a third good question for dependence. What's the third question that we got for dependence? What do you need to do to be more alive or so others can depend on you? What, that's, that's really good. That, that's, uh, what can you do to be more reliable so that others can depend on you? That, that's one that um, you could look at it more personal there as well. Who am I trusting more than God? 
<laughs> he won't say it very loud. Donald said, who am, I who am I trusting more than God? <laughs> who am I trusting more than God? That, that's great because they're so, I, and I can tell you this personally as well. I don't have time to go into all of it. But there was, uh, there was a girl that I dated my sophomore year in college. And I definitely put all of my trust in her and not in the Lord. And uh, when she broke up with me, I was broken. And I went to one of my teachers and I said, what am I supposed to do in this situation? And he said, it sounds like you made her an idol in your life. And the Lord took her away so that you, wouldn't de that you would depend on him again. And it hit me. And, um, but, but that is true. There are times that we depend on relationships with other people to, to fill a void when it needs to be on Christ. Uh, one more, anybody? All right. So, oh, yes, sir. Um, what are you in danger of putting into ideology? What are you in danger of put? Yep. What are you in danger of putting into ideology? So, what's something that it's not quite an idol yet, but you're um, but you're in danger if you don't stop that that, that could happen. That's really good. So, hopefully, um, you now have twelve or eighteen questions to start with, um, and, and so that's a that's a great starter. And again, if you go online, there are tons of questions. These are these are pretty. You would be surprised because they are hard to think of. But if you go look for a list. There are some questions and you think, man, that's a really tough question to answer. And I would have never even thought about asking that. And so there are a lot of good ones. But as we close, to, to sum up discipleship here, um, to sum it up, ultimately accountability can be a means in which God draws us through the friendship and fellowship of others to himself. Self-sufficiency says that we don't need anyone, but humility shouts for help from those God has placed in our lives. That this habit of sharing and praying with others will inevitably teach us how to cast our cares on the only one who can fully bear their weight and who loves us with an unfailing love. God graciously reminds us that apart from Him, we can do nothing. And one great means of that reminder are the brothers and sisters He puts in our lives. And so with that, let's pray. Father God... Um...